you know, I wasn't sure whether I was going to make this video. Honestly, I really wasn't. But the amount of you that were posting in the comments across all of my videos that you wanted to hear my thoughts on this Bob Gimlin shark attack cover up video was astonishing. I think there must have been hundreds of you, literally. It's interesting. There has to be some kind of crossover niche between these two areas of YouTube. And I'm not really sure how that's happened. Shark science and conspiracy theories, two things that in my mind just don't go together. But hey, here we are. There's clearly a lot of you out there that enjoy watching videos about conspiracy theories. I know that I've got a few mates who listen to podcasts about them, that kind of thing. But for those of you that watch the channel regularly, you guys will know my thoughts about conspiracy theories. And I'm generally not their biggest fan, especially when they revolve around sharks. Yeah, Megalodon is definitely still extinct, guys. Now, I'd have never have seen Bob Gimlin's video had you guys not been posting it in the comments every single day for the last four weeks. And so for those of you who've clicked on this video thinking, what the hell is going on? Who's he talking about? I have no idea who this is. Bob Gimlin is a faceless content creator right here on YouTube. Bob, of course, isn't his real name, but for the purposes of today's video, I'll be referring to him as Bob. Anyway, his channel entirely revolves around conspiracy theories and cryptids, Bigfoot, giant man-eating animals, that kind of thing. But recently he decided to make a conspiracy theory video about shark attacks. Now, the reason why I initially wasn't gonna make a retort video is because sometimes when you respond to conspiracies like this, you actually end up validating it as a rational and logical side of the argument. And 99 times out of 100, it isn't. Shark Bites is a science fact-based channel. We deal in evidence here and that evidence informs our opinion on the truth and I will always give you the scientific truth about sharks. I don't sugarcoat them and pretend these animals are harmless but at the same time I also don't massively exaggerate them either. In the end though sometimes curiosity gets the better of you and after disagreeing with a few things that he said within a really small five minute section of the video I decided to watch the entire thing. Yep the whole hour and seven minutes of it because how could I respond to something if I didn't take the time to get the whole picture? That's a really important point there. Now I want to make this clear straight away because I imagine there's going to be a few subscribers from Bob's channel coming over to Shark Bites to defend him. I am not making this video to attack or belittle him. Even though he'd probably fire back and call me a shark apologist, he refers to shark apologists in this video quite a few times and I'm not entirely sure who he's referring to, conservationists, shark scientists, behaviorists, I have no idea. And so I reckon there's a good chance today that I'll get quite a few people in the comments coming over and slinging that shark apologist trope at me, but any of you who watch Shark Bites will know that's not the case. I'm a scientist by training and I conduct scientific research on these animals. I try and educate people about them as well and importantly I want to try and save them from going extinct because they're a really important animal in our oceans. And by the sounds of it Bob Gimlin also likes sharks as well. I do think he's got a bit of a strange way of showing it but that's what he says. I think the overarching reason though I wanted to make this video is because throughout the entirety of it the whole hour and seven minutes there is a lot of misinformation flying around left right and center. And I think sometimes you just got to set the record straight. So for those of you that haven't watched it or don't want to watch it or simply just didn't have the free hour and 10 minutes that I happen to have on a Friday afternoon, I'll briefly summarize it for you. In the first hour or so of the video, Bob goes through nine different fatal shark attacks that happened in the year 2015, six of which are officially classified as shark attacks and the extra three are not officially classified. And I'm pretty sure the list he's using is from Hal's Sharks Happen database, which already you've got to take with a pinch of salt from the start here. So he goes through each incident in apparent detail, of which some of those details I think are exaggerated from a storytelling perspective because we simply don't have the available information. And it's also fairly clear as to how he's chosen to present the video, capitalizing on fear or fear in the viewer. Videos that press heavily into fear or perhaps fear of the unknown tend to do particularly well on YouTube. It's all to do with our psyche, so humans are hardwired to pay very close attention to threats and creators use that here on the platform to keep you watching. But just have a look at the amount of these fear-derived words that commonly crop up within the transcript of the video. Threat, terrifying, horror, many of these are used several times throughout the hour and it's tapping into a deep part of our brains that not only builds a mental image of these animals, but also keeps you fixed on the video. Anyway, after highlighting these fatal shark attacks, he goes on to claim that ISAF, the International Shark Attack File, is intentionally covering up these incidents or just not recording them. And in his opinion, there's somewhere between 100 and 400 fatal shark attacks happening around the world every single year. And those fatal shark attacks are gonna rise exponentially as we move into the future. We're coming back to it, guys. We're coming back to it.
And he ends the video by saying that he really likes sharks and is surprised that there isn't even more than his already very high fatalities estimate. Now, because we can't go through the entire video and pick out every little sentence that he says, because we'd literally just be here for hours and hours, I've decided to group my thoughts into two sections. The first are the bits where I somewhat agreed with what he was saying, and then the second is the bits where I disagreed. So first up then, we'll go through the things that I lent towards agreeing with. So this first attack of 2015 brings me to the first misconception about sharks, mistaken identity. Just before we start here, does anyone think that this guy sounds just like AVNJ? Zach from AVNJ. Zach, mate, if this is your faceless YouTube channel side hustle, I'm going to be really mad with you. Look, listen to this. Kid that it aired at sort of a different time every year, and that's probably why I never knew when it was going to happen, because I didn't know how to look it up and figure it out. And then... So this first attack of 2015 brings me to the first misconception about sharks. Mistaken identity. I swear, they sound so similar. Is it just me? I think it sounds like AVNJ, just talking slightly quieter and kind of moody. Anyway, I've already got really sidetrack there in the first five seconds of the video so really quickly then he's talking fairly disparagingly at the start here about the mistaken identity hypothesis which is the notion that sharks on occasion mistake humans for pinnipeds or seals and while i think there definitely are some shark attack cases where mistakes have happened i do tend to agree with him here in that the theory doesn't quite check out and it's definitely peddled out quite a lot by conservationists i think it's much more likely that in cases where mistaken identity has been cited you can instead attribute it more towards explorative or investigative bites. As in the shark in question is exploring whatever that object is in the environment with the only tactile tool it has at its disposal, its mouth. He goes on to put some images next to each other and says that he doesn't think they look alike at all, but he's not mentioned here how our human eyes are completely different to shark eyes and how we perceive objects is entirely different to how a shark perceives them. That isn't me defending the mistaken identity hypothesis, by the way. My opinion on mistaken identity has changed over the years to the point now where I don't back it, but I do think vision and how it differs between animals is an important detail that's often overlooked. A bit later on then he talks here about how the size of sharks isn't really worth considering because any shark over a certain size is capable of causing enough damage to your body to end your life. And yeah, I do agree. I've always said that any shark species, if it's over six foot in length, has enough power in its bite to cause serious damage to your body. It doesn't matter if it's a reef shark, a tiger shark, or a white shark. If that shark species is pushing six feet and above, it can absolutely be dangerous. Something that is inarguably more harmful than helpful are shark nets. Despite what people think, shark nets don't actually go to the bottom. <laughs> So right there. And yeah, again, I'll agree with him on shark nets here. They really don't do anything to prevent sharks from swimming close to beaches because they can absolutely just swim underneath them. And some people have even said that shark nets can actually end up increasing the number of big sharks close to beaches because the nets end up trapping all sorts of marine life like turtles, dolphins, other small harmless shark species, and then they get scavenged on by small predators Blood ends up in the water and then bang, you've got loads of big sharks attracted to that blood. And so you're basically relying on the people who monitor the nets to remove whatever's been entangled really quickly before it starts bleeding out into the water. And sometimes that kind of thing can happen at night. So it's not getting removed. And so aside from those three things that I've just mentioned there, pretty much everything else I disagree with him on throughout the entire video. So let's have a look then at some of the things I disagreed with. And this brings me to the next uh, myth bite and weight. So Bob describes the bite and weight or bite and spit hypothesis as nonsense and a myth. And while I'm sure there are some people out there that do disagree with it, it is definitely a behavior that has been observed. Again, it probably more ties into the explorative slash investigative bite thing, but this behavior plays into the cautious nature of sharks. If you've ever been in the water with these animals or even seen videos of them in the water around humans, they're almost always incredibly cautious. They'll circle from a distance before gradually getting closer. They'll often approach from behind behind and that caution doesn't just immediately disappear the moment they bite something. Animals that have been bitten by a shark can still prove to be a threat. Seals have really long sharp claws that could easily gouge a shark's eye. Hell, why do you think white sharks roll their eyes into the back of their heads when they bite down on something? It's because they're trying to protect a relatively vulnerable part of their body, the eye. So that caution remains even after they've bitten down on something and there are plenty of examples in the literature and anecdotally that some shark species perform the bite and spit behavior, especially the white shark. That caution is a behavior behavioral trait that has evolved over millions of years. The cautious individuals are the ones that don't end up getting seriously injured by their prey. They survive and then pass on those behavioral traits to the next generation. Sure, not all sharks do this and it's not a strategy that's used every single time. It's context dependent, but it's not a myth. Okay, so this next one's a bit of a broader disagreement across large sections of his video, but 
On several occasions, he cites that ISAF is covering up incidents and he just ignores the concept here that sharks will scavenge. Throughout the video, Bob claims that the international shark attack file is deliberately not including certain incidents in their database because they're trying to cover up the number of shark attacks. Specifically, these are incidents where somebody might have been lost at sea and they've never recovered the body or maybe they have recovered the body at a later date, but it was unable to be confirmed as a shark attack. One of the examples he cites is Italian diver Eugenio Masala, who was lost while diving off the coast of Sardinia, although when he was found, he had wounds consistent with that of a shark bite. But the bloke was missing for six days at sea. Six days. There is absolutely no way of telling whether that guy was actively bitten by a shark or whether a shark just scavenged on his body. You just can't discern between the two, so ISAF, of course, can't include that in their database. I think to suggest that that's them partaking in some kind of cover-up is a bit of a stretch. What it actually is, is them making sure that their published data set is valid and reliable. Bob also references the Cameron Robbins incident where Cameron was classified as lost at sea because his body was never found. And sure, based on the location, there's a chance that at some point that night after Cameron jumped overboard, he was attacked by a shark or he was scavenged on by a shark. But because his body was never found, it's just as likely that he ended up running out of energy and drowned during the night, sank to the bottom where his body was fed on by bloody crabs for Christ's sake. I know it sounds silly, yes, but that's my point. Without the evidence, you can't tell what happened. And so you can probably see there why ISAF wouldn't be including that one in their database. Their data, which undergoes statistical analyses, have to be reliably confirmed or validated. And for those incidents, you just can't do that. So they have to be excluded. Now, I'm not going to sit here and claim to you that the international shark attack file is perfect because it's not. And you know what? I think if you asked scientists like Gavin Naylor or Ralph Collier whether they thought their databases were perfect, they tell you they weren't either. There's definitely a few things that I disagree on with ISAF, particularly their classification of provoked and unprovoked. And I imagine if you ask some other scientists, they might also disagree as well. But just because ISAF or GSAF aren't perfect and people disagree with them on certain things, it doesn't mean that they're covering up shark attacks or are deliberately trying to mislead people. These are world-renowned specialists who have been working in their field for decades. What possible reason could they have for just making it all up? Because by their own analysis, they've confirmed that shark attacks globally are increasing. Very steadily, yes, but they are increasing. Surely if they were lying about it or fudging the numbers, they'd be trying to show us evidence that shark attacks were decreasing, right? But they're not claiming that. And even though I, as a scientist, would disagree with them on a few things related to shark attacks, to suggest they're involved in some kind of sinister cover-up is pretty disrespectful to them as scientists. Let me ask you this, and it's going to sound a bit savage. Who are you going to believe? The scientists who have spent their entire adult lives working, researching, and analyzing this area of research or the faceless YouTube channel that made an hour video about it. <laughs> Come on, guys. And don't tell me it's Bob because he hasn't got any vested interests. He absolutely does. They're called click-through rate and watch time. Trust me, I would know. Right, so we get towards the end of Bob's video here and we're hit with this. Guess that there are between 100 and 400 fatal shark attacks every year. I know what I said, laugh all you want. 100 to 400 fatal shark attacks every year. And from what I can tell, he's just plucked that number out of thin air. If we use his example from 2015, where he documents nine fatal shark attacks, but ISAF only officially lists six of them, by his analysis, he's got three more, or in other words, a 50% increase. Pretty helpfully, the numbers for the rolling five-year average of fatal shark attacks that ISAF lists are the same here. And that data shows us that we've got a rolling five-year average of six fatal shark attacks every single year. So applying that percentage increase from 2015, the number should be nine. But looking at the lower end of his guess, 100, that's a 1,500% increase on the actual numbers. And then at the higher end of his guess, 400, that's a 6,500% increase. It's just numbers plucked out of thin air. According to him, the justification for some of these wacky numbers here are because we never hear about shark attacks in places like South America, Southeast Asia, or the Philippines. And in 2015, there were no recorded shark attacks here. So because of that, it must mean that fatal shark attacks globally are 1,500% higher than they actually are. It's just bonkers. And just as a quick side note, we do hear about shark attacks in all of the places that Bob mentions. There have been plenty of records for fatal and non-fatal incidents in places like Chile, the Galapagos Islands, and Brazil. Hell, there were even three serious bites where people lost limbs in Brazil in 2023 alone. The Philippines has reported bites in 2017 and 2025, Indonesia in 2016, 2017, and 2024. So to say that there aren't bites being recorded in these kind of places just isn't true. And 
and you can't use that as justification to ramp up your own numbers by thousands of percent. He also leaves out the fact here as well that in some of these locations, particularly Southeast Asia and Indonesia, shark populations have seen some of the biggest declines globally. Two thirds of shark species assessed in this part of the world are classified as threatened. And in some places, you've got shark and ray catch rates down by over 50%. The numbers that are being caught have literally halved in just over 30 years halved. So a case could easily be made here that there aren't as many shark attacks coming out of these locations because there might not be as many large predatory sharks here anymore. Overall, I'd say that while, yeah, the shark attack databases might miss a few reports here or there happening around the world, or they might classify something differently and not include it in their database, there just isn't any evidence there's some kind of mass shark attack cover-up going on. And Bob Gimlin's analysis is jam-packed with speculation and assumptions. And unfortunately, when it comes to science, speculations and assumptions just aren't going to cut it. Scientists work in a world where data-driven evidence is fundamental to making conclusions, and that's how it's gonna stay. I'm keen to hear all of your thoughts on this one. How many times am I gonna get called a shark apologist in the comments? What's he bets? Five times, 10 times? Anyway, if you're interested in learning about some real shark bite numbers, then you might quite enjoy this video about Recife in Brazil. This stretch of coastline at one point in time was probably considered to be one of the most dangerous places in the world to go in the sea. So if you wanted to learn about Recife and all the crazy things that went down there, make sure you give this video a watch.